It is one of the most ridiculed stories in the Bible. Liberal scholars have a hard time looking at the story of Jonah. Jonah, it's a story about a big fish swallowing a man and the man living to tell about it. Liberal scholars just have a difficult time in this idea of a whopper of a fish story is kind of how they would look at it. They really struggle with several miracles involved in the story. Uh, what we'll see, and we'll see at least three of the four miracles tonight. We have the story of the storm, and that's where the storm brewed up at the word of the Lord. We also see where the storm calmed at the word of the Lord. We see where the fish swallowed Jonah, Jonah remaining alive the whole time. And then finally in chapter 4, we'll look at the story of the vine, uh, the miracle of the vine, if you will. So scholars have a difficult time looking at that number of miracles and the whole story in general. They look at it and they have a lot of questions about it. One of the things that we notice as we read through the story of Jonah is that it, it's different from that of other Old Testament prophets. Other Old Testament prophets, the story is really about their message, about their prophecy, but not so with Jonah. The story of Jonah is really about the prophet himself. It's about his struggles. And it's about the fact that God refused to give up on him. So that's going to be a key emphasis as we go through and we look at this story. Uh, one of the things, because this story is so different, it's left some people to ask, what do we do with it? Like I said, there's some scholars that are liberal scholars that have problems with it. So we ask this, this question, four possibilities. Is the story historical? Is this the story about a real man that really ran away from God, who really got swallowed by a fish, who really preached to a group of people, who really repented, and then he really got mad about it? Is the story real? Is it historical? Some will suggest that the story is an allegory. That's a story with a moral to it. Others say, ah, oh, it's just a parable, which may or may not be true. And then others will suggest that it is just fictional, that there's nothing about the story that's true. We believe the story to be true. And, and we don't have to just say, oh, that's what I think. We have evidence to point to the validity of the story of Jonah, to the man Jonah and his story. In the Old Testament, 2 Kings chapter 14, verse 25, we find out that Jonah served as a prophet during the time of Jeroboam. We are getting near the time uh, where Israel will be handed over into Assyrian captivity. But Jonah was a real man, real prophet, and it's part of the recorded history in the Old Testament, in the book of 2 Kings. Then in the New Testament, Jesus verified the man Jonah and the ministry of Jonah. What we see in Matthew chapter 12, beginning in verse 39, Jesus answered, A wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and now something greater than Jonah is here. Several different times in this statement from Jesus, he talks about the validity of Jonah, that Jonah was in the fish. The fish swallowed Jonah alive. He was in the belly of the fish three days, three nights. Jesus used that real story to talk about the reality that he would die on the cross and remain in the tomb for three days. Friends, this is a real story. And then he went back and he talked about how the city, how the people of Nineveh repented at the preaching of Jonah. Jesus would not have talked about a made-up story, not in these two cases. Not when you're talking about Jesus on the cross and in the grave, also, not when you're talking about the repentance of people at the Word of God. So what we have is we have evidence in the Old Testament and the New that Jonah was a real man who really struggled, but who had a ministry 
as a prophet. What we want to do is we're going to go through probably about a chapter a week. Uh, this will be a brief series. We'll go through a chapter a week. Tonight's lesson, as we go through chapter 1, fits under the title of You Can Run, But You Can't Hide. I think that's a great title for the story, given the message in the story in Jonah chapter 1. So let's start there. We're just going to work our way through the chapter. Chapter 1, verse 1. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. That is Jonah chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Let's start off with some common ground. Let's start off with some good about Jonah. There is not a lot of commonality between Jonah and other Old Testament prophets. However, the first line of the story is common ground. The word of the Lord came. That is a statement that we find in Isaiah. It's found in uh, Isaiah chapter, I think it's chapter 34, no, chapter 38, verse 4. Chapter 38, verse 4, then the word of the Lord came to Isaiah. But we also find this in the book of Jeremiah, the book of Ezekiel, also obviously in Jonah, then Haggai and Zechariah. So we have at least six different prophets in the Old Testament where this phrase is used. And in some of those, it's used quite a bit in their stories. Of course, we know that some of those prophet stories are longer than others. So here we are. We have this common ground. The word of the Lord came. The word of the Lord came to Jonah. Uh, wanted Jonah. The Lord wanted Jonah to go to Nineveh and preach against it. The Lord had noted his wickedness of the people of Nineveh. And he was calling on them to repent. It's interesting. You can't run. You can run, but you can't hide. That held true for the sin of the Ninevites. And so we have God sending Jonah. I want you to go and I want you to preach against that city. Now again, the story of the prophets, this is where there's a hard split, a hard divide. Because while the other prophets obeyed the word of the Lord, they might have struggled, but they obeyed the word of the Lord. <laughs> Not Jonah. Jonah ran away from the Lord. So we have in Jonah, there's this difference between him and the other prophets. Like I said, those other Old Testament prophets, the stories and the books of those are really about the message delivered by the prophets. But not so with Jonah. It really is about Jonah the man. There's a, a good opportunity for us just to stop for a moment and think, okay... I'm in Jonah's shoes. How would I respond? The word of the Lord would come to us and we would be told by God to do something. How would we respond? Wouldn't you like to think that we would respond like Abraham did in Genesis chapter 12? The Lord told Abram to go. And Abram went. Some of us are probably more like Moses in Exodus chapters 3 and 4. God came to Moses and told him, I want you to go. I want you to deliver the Israelites from Egyptian slavery. Go to Pharaoh and tell him to let my people go. Moses had questions. <laughs> Moses had excuses. At the end of the day, really, it is. It's just excuses. Moses had excuses why he didn't want to do it. But he did. I really would hope that we would not have the attitude of Jonah where the Lord tells us to do something and we just flat disobey him. That's what Jonah did. You see, we can go in wholehearted obedience without question. Uh, we can struggle with it but still obey the Lord. We just don't want to be Jonah. Not this time, not right here, where Jonah received this message to go and to preach, and he did exactly what God did not want him to do. Jonah ran away from the Lord. Verse 4, 
Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea. The Lord sent, remember that, such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid and each cried out to his own God. And they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below the deck where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. Interesting lesson. There are a lot of lessons in this first chapter about the sailors. Uh, One of those is about in times of crisis and how do we respond. Huge contrast between what we see from Jonah and from the sailors. The sailors, they they were frightened. Uh, Priorities changed. Now, boy, they started praying, didn't they? They were praying to their own gods, little g, but they prayed nonetheless. But, But... it's interesting because the, the cargo, the material possessions, they had little importance at this point. Usually when you look at man and you look at the, the desire for things and for money, uh, that kind of is a huge temptation for many, but not, not in a crisis like this. They were throwing cargo overboard so that they could make the ship uh, hopefully where it could weather the storm easier, and, and they didn't think anything about that. So what do we do in times of a crisis? Well, again, there's something about a crisis that it can determine uh, how we respond, and it's interesting to watch how some people respond. Remember, what did the sailors do? And they started praying, and they started getting rid of stuff, realizing what things really mattered at that time. There are people who... In a crisis, we'll get religious. Uh, There will be uh, times in a crisis where people will want to make changes. There will be times in a time of crisis, people will pray. This is when people begin to make promises to God. God, if you'll just get me through this, then I will. It's like we want to bargain with God in that time of crisis. But there are some people that in a time of crisis just decide... Not going with God on this one. I'm going to take matters in my own hands. And if I put Jonah in any of those categories, I put him in number four. The sailors were afraid. They were praying to their own gods, little g, but they were also throwing cargo. I mean, they were making every effort to try to stay alive. But there's something about Jonah in the middle of this storm that he slept. I know Jesus slept through a storm in the New Testament. That's because his faith was great and he knew who was in charge. Jonah, I think, had resigned himself to disobedience. And whatever happened, happened. We're going to see that as we continue in the story. Chapter 1, verse 6, the captain went to Jonah and asked, How can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he'll take notice of us so that we will not perish. Then the sailors said to each other, Come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. They cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. In a crisis, what happened? The sailors sailors had prayed. The sailors wanted to find out what they needed to do. They wanted to find out who needed to change. They're interested in making things right. Jonah? Jonah's resigned himself. Jonah has resigned himself that what it is will be. It is what it is. Jonah knew that he was being disobedient to the Lord. And he had resigned that that would be his destiny. Chapter 1, verse 8, so they ask him, tell us, who is responsible for making all this trouble for us? What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? He answered, I am a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. This terrified them and they asked, what have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord because he had already told them. I think this is great. There are some things, again, we see about the sailors, we see about Jonah. The sailors were amazed. They were stunned 
that a prophet of God, of the Lord God Almighty, of Yahweh, they were stunned that a prophet of Yahweh would disobey him. But Jonah, all right, so, so where are we? You know, what have you done? What have you done? What have you done? What did Jonah have to do to make things right? Repent. Turn. Change. But we're at a point because there had to be something. There was something about Jonah and his attitude toward the Ninevites. Something about his dislike for them that was at such a level Jonah didn't want to go, he wasn't going to go, and Jonah would rather die than go. And his response, his reaction, his attitude stunned a group of sailors who were unbelievers. Verse 11. Sea's getting rougher and rougher, so they ask him, what should we do to you to make the sea calm down for us? You're the one who started this mess. How do we get out of it? What do we need to do? They're asking the question. Verse 12, Jonah replied, Pick me up and throw me into the sea, and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Again, what it... Jonah knew that this sea and this storm had come up because of his disobedience. He confessed that. He said the same thing about his actions that God had said about it. What did he not do? He didn't repent. There was nothing. We see no indication whatsoever through any of this chapter that Jonah had a willingness to change. He had made up his mind. He wasn't going to go. He was not going to go and preach to that group at Nineveh. He was determined on that. He would throw me overboard. That was, his, that was the best answer that he had. Just throw me overboard. Verse 13. Instead, instead, the men did their best to row back to land. But they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. Then they cried out to the Lord, Please, Lord, do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man. For you, Lord, have done as you pleased. And then they took Jonah, they threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. At this the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord, and they made vows to Him. So what do we see? Again, lessons from the sailors. that They did not want to throw Jonah over. They were more compassionate than Jonah. Jonah showed no compassion whatsoever for the people of Nineveh. Go preach to them. Tell them to repent. Nah, I'm not going to do that. All right, well, when you get in that boat, it's going to get rough. That's fine. It's going to put other people in danger. I don't care. That's Jonah's attitude. So the sailors start asking, man, what can we do? They say, and this one's on you, Jonah. What do we do? I ah, just throw me overboard. Really? Man, the sailors, now they're more compassionate than Jonah. Did you notice though? The sailors, they'd been praying to their gods, little g. Now they turn and they pray to the Lord. They asked the Lord to forgive them. Lord, we're fixed to, we're fixed to throw this guy in the water. We're going to throw him in the sea. Lord, forgive us for that. And then when they threw him into the sea and everything calmed down, they offered sacrifices to the Lord. What does that mean? They worshiped. So I'm looking at the reaction of the sailors through this first chapter. And this will be the, the last that we see of them. But what we see is that they went from being unbelievers, praying to their idols, to they prayed to the Lord, they showed compassion, and then they worshipped. The sailors changed in more of a positive direction than Jonah. All we see in Jonah is that going from a man of a prophet that we thought would obey God to a runaway prophet who disobeyed God. 
verse 17. Just when you think the story's over, because if it ended at verse 16, we're thinking Jonah's in the water and that's it. But it's not. It's not it because God refused to give up on Jonah. This is the beginning to me of what's a beautiful part of the story. Now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. I love the words of Jim Black. He's minister of the Lord's church. He says that the fish was a course corrective. <laughs> I like that. That is a great line. That the fish was a course corrective put there by God to get Jonah back on the right track. It wasn't there to harm Jonah but to save Jonah. Oh, what a great message. So this is a story that at this point, we look at it as a flannel graph story. It's for little children in Sunday school. But we need to see, friends, this is something that, that boy, this is an adult story. This is an adult story because we are ones who will hear the command of the Lord to go. We have to decide how are we going to respond. When the Lord tells us to go, what is our response? Do we, do we run to God? Perhaps you need to be baptized for the remission of your sins. God is calling you. It, it, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. We have an opportunity to come to God and find forgiveness through the blood of Jesus Christ. Will you, will you run to God. It may be that we hear the message of the Lord where He says go and, and we determine to run with God. Now both of those first two are, are statements and, and moves of obedience to the Lord. The man where the Lord says go, we will go. Where the Lord says, says speak, we will speak. Where the Lord says serve, we will serve. Where He says love, we will love. Where He says forgive, we will forgive. When there's a need to show courage, we'll show courage. When there's a need to encourage, we will encourage because we are running with the Lord. Or could it be that as we hear the word of the Lord, we're like, nope, not going to do that. And that's where we start picking and choosing verses in the Bible. And somehow we think that, well, we've got a pretty good batting average, that, you know, we obey most of them. And so somehow we think that that makes us okay. Jonah disliked a group of people. And as a result, he had no desire to share the message of God with them. I'll just let you stop for a moment and we'll let that sink in. Because we need to be a people that when the Lord says go, we go. And it doesn't matter if it's the family member that we can't stand. Boy, it just gets on our nerves. Doesn't matter if it's the neighbor that, you know, just, just is not a good neighbor. What if it's the person that has hurt us so badly we struggle to forgive? What if there's a group of people, whether it's because of, uh, whether it's because of economic status, whether it's because of race, whether it's because of gender, you take your pick, but they're different than us, and as a result... We don't want to share the message of God with them. So now tell me how we're different from Jonah. We have to make a decision. We will either run to God, we will run with God, or we're going to be running away from God, running against God. And it's my prayer that if we really want to be the people that God has called us to be, then we're going to run to God that we are going to run with God. Because what we will see later in the story is that when we run with God, that great things happen. Lives are changed. And, and that's an opportunity for us as a church to be a people who share the gospel 
and to watch lives change as people grow closer and closer to Jesus Christ.